models and event study uh, regressions can produce estimates that are just difficult to interpret when there's treatment effect heterogeneity, not across individuals necessarily, but across groups and times, right? And so I think that the original paper by Brusiak and Jaravel, uh, as far as I know, sort of started the entire literature. And, and then there's, you know, have been and you know, probably more papers than I should mention, or than I could that I have time to mention. Um, but at this point, it's very clear that um, the, the, the sort of standard classical regression DD approach just has a number of different problems. And so people have uh, analyzed these problems and developed alternative estimation approaches. Um, and I think, you know, the most uh, well known ones are Callaway and Santana. Um, and soon in Abraham and De Chase Martin and Dolphy Um and uh, and there's probably more that I'm not aware of, right? So, like I said, I, I feel like I'm still also trying to get to grips with all of this literature. Um, and I think that all of these estimators are are really excellent, right? And so I didn't write my paper because I felt like there was any sort of problem with these estimators. I just sort of uh, you know had an alternative idea that I thought was sort of interesting. And so that's what I do in my paper. So my paper sort of uh, opens up with just me presenting some really simple, I think kind of high level intuition for why regression differences and differences doesn't always make sense when we have that particular kind of treatment effect heterogeneity. And then that intuition led me to develop sort of an alternative estimation approach, which I called uh, two stage differences and differences. Um, and the way that the, the estimator works on a really basic level is in the first stage, you just take untreated outcomes, right? So, so outcomes for observations that are untreated and regress those on group and period effects. And then in the second stage, you subtract those estimated group and period effects from observed outcomes and regress the differences on treatment status. Um, and that's basically the whole estimator. Um, and so, you know, like I mentioned before, um, I kind of feel like my paper is still a work in progress. So if anybody has any feedback on it, I appreciate it. Um, and so when I was first thinking about this idea, I just thought this is promising, right? It's simple and it's intuitive. And I wasn't aware of anybody else using this approach. So I thought, oh, this would be maybe a good idea for something that I could write up and maybe get some feedback on. And it turns out that this idea definitely does have some promise. Um, but it also turns out that actually um, variations on this basic approach have actually been proposed several times before. And I actually wasn't aware of any of this when I first started working on the paper. And I, I learned some of this from the new Borussiak, Charvel, and Spice paper. But a, a Gobilon and Maniac had suggested a similar approach in kind of a different context. And then a paper by Shu and another paper by Leah Wong and Shu um, were working with a similar idea. Um, there were some labor economists, Thakral and Tho, who had also suggested um, a, a similar approach. And then finally, uh, the most, most recently, I became aware of the Borussiak, Jaravel, and Spice paper, which is essentially a much more sophisticated take on what I, what I was doing. And um, I mean, I think that you know, that's a, it, everybody likes that paper, but I found it especially interesting because to me, it was kind of like looking at the answer key to the problem set that I've been working on. So I was very impressed with that paper. Um, and so it turns out that, uh, you know, uh, it, it, that, uh, you know, this is an interesting idea um, and actually it has a, a lot more of a history than I was aware of um, when I was first working on this. And I think that the way that I'm thinking about this is probably the least sophisticated of all of the different um, you know, research teams who have, been, who have been toying around with this idea. But I actually kind of think that there might be some value in my relative, relatively simple approach. So, um, so that's kind of where I, where I stand right now in terms of thinking about my paper. So uh, in, in, in the beginning of my paper, I, I, I start off with a sort of a, a relatively simple um, discussion of the problem with uh, differences and differences regression. And this is like kind of a, a very simple argument. And I don't know if it's really all that necessary, especially now that so many people are familiar with the various decomposition theorems that, that people have provided. Um, but when I was first thinking about this, I hadn't read any of these papers, right? Which I probably shouldn't admit, but uh, but I, I hadn't. And so um, I I have to confess that that before thinking about this and before reading any of the literature, I naively thought that a diff and diff regression was always going to be identifying some sort of ATT, some sort of average effect of the treatment on the treated. 
And I don't remember at this point exactly why I thought that, but I think that my int intuition was that, look, you're controlling for these group effects, you're controlling for these period effects, and you've got treatment status. And so I, I think I thought that the coefficient on the treatment status variable was just going to capture the average deviation from group and period effects among treated units, which you could interpret as an ATT, right? And again, this seems really silly now that we have all, all of the decomposition theorems that people approve. Um, but I actually think I'm pr was probably in pretty good company in that belief, um, you know, before I had read the literature. I, I, and I, I know for a fact that I have seen um, in some applied papers, um, people making that claim. And I think that, you know, my misunderstanding and misunderstanding, um, you know, for, for, uh, from anybody else that thought about this the same way that I did, um, probably just was stemming from, you know, not, not really ever thinking critically about how diff and diff regression works. And so when I started hearing claims about, you know, problems with diff and diff regressions, uh, when they're staggered adoption and treatment effect heterogeneity, I just had a difficult time understanding them at first, right? I found them kind of counterintuitive because I had this incorrect intuition. And so um, my, uh, the first part of my paper is basically just my attempt to reconcile uh, the decomposition results with the intuition that I started off with. So um, I, I kind of want to, I'm going to try to kind of go through this in, in an example that's even a little bit simpler that I went through it in the paper. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, the way that we all learn about diff and diff uh, to begin with is in the two by two case, right? And, you know, we sort of learn that if the usual parallel trends assumption holds, right? And I'll, I'll talk about my sort of internal definition of parallel trends more formally later. But if parallel trends holds, we know that the average effect of the treatment on the treated can be identified by just looking at the difference, um, you know, at the difference in post pre differences for the treatment group and the control group. Right, and that's very intuitive. And then we also know that instead of taking this difference manually, we could also run this regression where we, we take the outcome and we regress it on post treat and post times treat, right? And since, and post times treat um, is also the same thing as just time varying treatment status, right? So we could run the regression that way too. And it's very intuitive to us, you know, that this regression tells us the same thing, or the coefficient on, on post times treat in this regression tells us the same thing as this sort of manual difference in difference. Um, but how do we actually know that, right? I mean, when I, when, you know, when I was first learning about differences and differences, somebody told me this, and it was very intuitive, me, intuitive to me because it just reminded me of stuff I learned in my undergraduate econometrics class about you know, how you can interpret dummy variables. And so I never really thought about it. But if you wanted to justify formally why this is the same thing as this, um, one way to think about it is that the conditional expectation of outcomes, right, given um, post and treat, uh, takes this form, right? It just equals post, uh, you know, uh, post plus treat plus post times treat, and this conditional expectation is linear in these three variables: in post, treat, and post times treat. Um, and so this is essentially a saturated regression function. And one thing that we also know is that if the conditional expectation function is linear, then the population regression function identifies, it, right? And so that's something that I, I'm sure I was taught in graduate school, but I don't think I understood it until I read it in Ingrist and Pischke. Um, and so that's one way of thinking about why this works, right? Is that the conditional expectation function is linear. So if we do a linear regression, then we identify the, condi the population conditional expectation function. Um, okay, so that's the two by two case and, and everybody understands that. What happens in the three by three case, right? So suppose that um, we have a, a three by three case with a, a never treated group, right? Well, in this case, now what we have is two period variables, right? We have a post period for every time a new group adopts the treatment and we have two group variables, right? Two different treat variables. So if we assume that parallel trends holds, then we can write the expected value of outcome given these uh, two post variables and these two treat variables in this form, right? So we're gonna control for post one and post two. So these are sort of like the period variables. And then we'll control for treat one and treat two. So these are sort of like the group variables. And then we have all of the interactions between those variables, um, except for that, since we're assuming parallel trends doesn't hold, we don't need to control for an interaction between being the second treated group and it being the first post period because we're assuming that there's no effect there. 
right? So we, we could write uh, this conditional expectation like this, right? And if we do this, then we know that beta five, beta six, and beta seven, so these are the coefficients on the interaction between treat, the treat variables and the post variables, those things are gonna identify the average effect of the treatment um, um, for each group in the periods that they're treated, right? So the group specific, um, the group and period specific ATTs. So this is sort of how this would extend to the three by three case um, with a never treated group. And another way that we could think about this is that in this case, now there's actually three different treatment variables, right? So we have D11, which is an interaction between post one and treat one. D12, right, an interaction between post one and treat two. And then D22, the interaction between post two and treat two, right? And so these correspond to the different times that our two different treatment groups actually receive the treatment. So we could also write this, this conditional expectation in this form, right, where we have, where we have three different um, treatment status variables. And this conditional expectation is linear in, in the post variables, the treat variables, and then these group by period specific um, treatment status variables. So if we ran this regression, it would also identify the, the group by period specific ATTs because this is a linear uh, uh, conditional expectation function. So the population regression function, if we correctly specified it, would identify this thing, right? Um, and so that's another thing that you could do. And actually, I, I think that, that thinking about it like this is actually pretty good intuition for how some of the other estimators work too, right? So I think that if you think about sort of Callaway and Santana or Soon and Abraham, they're not doing this exactly, but, but this is sort of like a version of what they're doing, which is that they're estimating the different group by period specific ATTs, and then they combine them in some way to get summary measures of the effect of the treatment. And there's one other thing that's true in the three by three case, right, which is that if the ATTs were all the same, then because the sum of these group by period specific um, treatment status variables would just equal the overall treatment status variable, we could also write the conditional expectation function in this form, where we just have one treatment status variable, right? This is sort of like the usual regression DD specification. And if it were true that all of these group by period specific ATTs were the same, then this regression would identify the, the ATT, which is now homogeneous across groups and periods. And so again, we'd be back to a situation where the conditional expectation function was linear in group variables, period variables, and treatment status. And so we wouldn't have a problem, right? And this has sort of been the traditional view of differences and differences regression. Um, okay, so that maybe this is a little bit of a long-winded introduction, but then the question is, well, what happens if we use this specification, but the ATTs actually are uh, heterogeneous ac across groups and periods, right? And the answer to that question is, is just not really obvious when you're first thinking about it, at least if you're thinking about it in this way, because again, now the, con now the conditional expectation function is not linear in the post variables, the group variables and treatment status. And so it's not clear, we don't get an automatic identification result like we could get before. And that's really why we need the decomposition results that people have, have provided. Um, and another thing that's not obvious when you're, when you're in this case is what is even the target parameter that you're trying to estimate, right? Because now you have all these different treatment effects. What's the natural way to summarize these treatment effects, right? And it's really not clear how you should do that, but I, I sort of a natural candidate um, for how you might do that is to use what I was calling in the paper, the overall, uh, I, I guess I have a typo here, it should be the overall ATT. Um, which I'm just going to call beta bar for the time being, which would be the average across all treated groups and treated periods. And so if you thought about trying to identify this and you inserted that into the conditional expectation function that I had on the previous slide, you could write it in this form where you'd have the post variables, the treat variables, and then you'd have beta bar times treatment status. But then if you do that, you have these remainder terms over here that involve the differences between the group and period specific ATTs and this overall average ATT and the group and period specific treatment status variables, right? And so if you think about this, um, these sort of remainder terms in the bottom of this expression, they're just not equal to zero. And also they involve interactions between the post variables and the treatment variables, right? And so what that means is that, again, this conditional expectation function written this way is just not linear in the post variables and the treat variables and treatment status, time varying treatment status. And so one thing that we, we can be fairly certain about is that in general, um, the sort of standard regression DD specification is also not gonna identify the overall 
ATT, right? Because this function, um, because this is the conditional expectation function when you think about it in terms of this overall average and these, these remaining terms don't go away, right? So again, it's still a nonlinear conditional expectation function. Okay. So this is just sort of like, I, 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 I had received some feedback that people found the way that I went through this to be a little bit confusing in the original paper. So I thought maybe that would be a little bit clarifying. Quickly delving into the general case. So then the notation that I, I was using was I, I divided individuals, which I was considering to be either people or individual states into, into groups, which are the same thing as treatment cohorts, right? And so that's what I represent. And then I, div I was dividing time um, into periods. So time is T and periods are P. And the periods are defined according to the adoption of the treatment by successive cohorts, right? So the idea is in my notation, group zero is a never treated group. Group one is treated in period one, group two becomes treated in period two and so forth. So in my notation, GPIT would represent the ith member of group G in the teeth year of period P, which is a little bit of a mouthful. So, and then in my notation also DGP, this is just an indicator for whether or not a member of group G, uh, and a member of group G in period P is treated. So it's really just the same thing as treatment status, right? Um, and then another thing that I should say is that all along I was kind of implicitly assuming that the treatment is irreversible and there's sort of no anticipation effects. I never even mentioned anything about that. So a couple of people have pointed that out and I feel a little bit embarrassed by it. So I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so this was my notation. And then to just sort of generalize the, the previous argument, you know, so we can define beta GP as being the average effect of the treatment for members of group G in period P. And then, you know, people use different parallel trends specifications. Um, I usually think about parallel trends just in terms of uh, the sort of the simple, you know, here's New Jersey in the pre-period, here's New Jersey in the post-period sort of thing. And, and so I, I see people doing that a lot. And so often people think about parallel trends using a specification that's something like this, where the expected outcome given your group, your period, and whether or not you're treated is just this, right? It's just your group fixed effect, right? Your period fixed effect, and then um, you know something multiplying uh, an indicator for whether or not you're treated, right? And, and if you think about it like this, if these beta GP differ by by G and P, then this thing is not going to be a linear expect a linear function because this thing involves interactions between group and period, and so. In particular, if we, if I now sort of define the, the overall ATT as just being the average of the beta GPs conditional on being treated, um, then we know that uh, this expectation can be written as group effects plus period effects plus the overall ATT times treatment status, but then we have the difference between your group and period specific uh, ATT and the overall ATT. Um, and then again, multiplied by uh, treatment status. And the thing is this last term here involves interactions between group and period, right? And so this function written this way is just not a linear function of a group effect, a period effect and treatment status because it has these, this non-linearity, it has these interactions between group and period. And so essentially what we have here is a non-linear conditional expectation function, which we're trying to approximate with a linear regression function. And there's essentially no guarantee that that's gonna work, right? And so, so to me, this was a helpful way of, of understanding why my initial intuition about differences and differences always identifying in ATT was incorrect, right? And the reason why is because the conditional expectation function is just, it's not linear and the non-linearities are introduced by conditioning on these group and period effects. Um, so again, this is very simple, but the sort of the conclusion of this is that it, it shouldn't be surprising that regression DD is gonna give you something weird when you've got staggered adoption and heterogeneous treatment effects because you're essentially approximating a, a non-linear function with a linear regression function. Although I should stress that this is really only sort of an intuitive way of thinking about it. Right? So it's not completely rigorous. And the reason why is because you know, linearity is really only a sufficient condition um, for the, the population regression function to identify the conditional expectation function. So that you, we really do need all the decomposition results, but, but, but this was helpful for me in understanding sort of at, 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 sort of a, the, at a base level, baseline level, um, why differences and differences can be problematic and why my initial intuition was, was incorrect. Um, Okay, 
So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I don't know. This was helpful for me. I hope it's clarifying for some people. Sometimes I worry that I'm making it, things even more confusing. But anyway, so then this sort of raises the question of, OK, well, if we're not identifying the overall ATT, what are we identifying? And you know, there are all these different decomposition results. Um, my favorite, I think a lot of people's favorite, is the Goodman-Bacon decomposition. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, it's one of those, those, those rare results that's somehow both amazing, but also really intuitive. Um, but, uh, but in this context, I think it's actually useful to think about this in a little bit of a different way. So what I talk about in the paper is that you know, if you do a population regression of Y on group effects, period effects, and treatment status, that's going to identify this weighted average of the group by period specific um, ATTs, where the weights are given by this expression. And what's going on in this expression is that PG, uh, I kind of used a shorthand notation to get this to fit on the slide, but PG is essentially the fraction of the time that group G is treated. And PP is the fraction of the time, is the fraction of the population that's treated in period P. And then P is just the treated fraction of the population, where I'm sort of defining the population as being a, a, over all groups and all time periods that we sort of have in our data that we're looking at, or the time frame that we're looking at. And then PGP, this is just the, the relative size of a GP cell, right, relative to the entire population that we're looking at. Right, so um, so th these are these are sort of the weights that OLS is using um, to aggregate up, or that the different diff, uh, regression specification is using to aggregate up these group specific um, ATTs, and then just one thing I really have to mention is I'm almost I'm pretty sure this is just really a special case of the decomp decomposition that Deshaies Martin and Dolphy uh, prove. Um, so. Uh, like I'm not saying that this is I'm not trying to take any credit for this decomposition. I just think it's really I think it's really useful, and I thought that it would be good in the paper to say something about what we actually do identify um, when we do these um, when we when we run these differences and differences regressions. Um, and the reason why I think this is useful is because it's very intuitive for thinking about uh, regression DD in terms of. Uh, an incorrectly specified conditional expectation function right and so my intuition for this is that the usual specification that we run is assuming that the treatment effects are homogeneous across all groups and periods and so when they're not when they're actually heterogeneous then that means that some of the variation in outcomes that's due to the due to the effect of the treatment has to be absorbed by the group and period effects and what this decomp decomposition is saying is that um, when a when a group is treated for more periods, then the more treatment effects that are accruing to that group are going to be absorbed by the group effects, right? They're going to look like sort of permanent. Uh, uh, the regression is going to interpret them as sort of permanent characteristics of those groups, and then at the same time, um, the the more units are treated in a particular period, the more the regression, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to sort of look at the data and in and interpret you know changes in outcomes that are happening in that period as being due to period effects right instead of being due to the treatment status because it has to do something with with the very you know with sort of like random variation or not not random variation but sort of deviations in in outcomes from sort of the implied average uh att um, when we, when you use a specification that assumes that that ATT has to be homogeneous ac across groups and times, right? And so essentially, um, what what one way of thinking about this is that you're using a misspecified regression, right? You're using a regression that's misspecified for the conditional expectation, and as a consequence, the group effects and the period effects are absorbing some of the variation that's really due to treatment status. And that's one way of thinking about why you get sort of a weird estimate when you do regression DD. Um, and I think this is this complements the intuition from other decompositions, right? So when people talk about, um, you know, what's going on with different different regression, they often use intuition that says, well, look, to some extent, what's happening is when you do regression DD, you are <clears throat> you're comparing newly treated units to some units who have already been treated, but the treatment effects for those units might be changing a little bit, and so those comparisons are are sort of contaminated a little bit. And I think that's really useful intuition. Um, but I think that this, the intuition from this other decomposition is kind of useful when you're thinking um, about regression DD, not in terms of the comparisons that it draws, but in terms of the way that it's misspecified for the conditional expectation function. And also to me, it's kind of amazing that, you know, these, these different ways of thinking about this actually have to be equivalent. Okay, so that's sort of my spiel on the, on the regression um, uh, decomposition.
So thinking about these ideas just sort of led me to this two stage approach. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, um, we can sort of think about the problem with regression DD as arising because the regression uh, specification is misspecified for conditional mean outcomes, right? Because conditioning on the group and period effects introduces some nonlinearity into the conditional expectation function. And that nonlinearity isn't captured by the, by the sort of canonical uh, regression DD specification. Um, but this sort of suggests something, right? Because um, if, if we actually knew the group and period effects, then we could just subtract them off from outcomes. And then we could look at the deviation between outcomes and the group and period effects and regress those on treatment status. And that would identify an overall average, an overall ATT. Um, but that argument assumes that we knew the group and period effects, but it turns out that in many cases, we can actually come up with good estimates of them, right? So if parallel trends holds, the group and period effects are actually identified from the subpopulation of untreated group periods, at least as long as we have untreated units in each period and we observe each group before it actually receives the treatment, right? And so to me, this suggests a, uh, this suggested a two-stage procedure, which is, okay, let's take outcomes, right, for untreated uh, observations and regress those on our fixed effects, right, on, on, on the group and period fixed effects. Um, again, just using the subsample of untreated observations. Let's save these fixed effects, and take them and manually adjust outcomes by removing these estimated treatment effects and take that difference and just regress it on treatment status, right? So this was sort of what led me to this idea. Um, and why does this work? Well, parallel trends, all right, the parallel trends assumption, the way that I wrote it implies that, that this is true, that the difference between expected outcomes and the effects equals just uh, your treatment effect times your treatment status variable, right? And we can do sort of a similar sort of decomposition of this and write it as the overall uh, ATT times treatment status plus this remainder term. Um, but this is a little bit of a different remainder term because when we take the expected value of this thing, conditional on treatment status, it actually equals zero, right? And so, um, and so what that means is that this expectation the expected, the ex expected uh, value of the difference between outcomes and the group and period effects conditional on treatment status actually is a linear function of treatment status. And so we can, we can identify the overall average ATT by just doing uh, a linear regression of these adjusted outcomes on treatment status. And so that's sort of like some, my, my intuition um, for, for why this procedure identifies um, the overall average ATT. Or at least that's one thing that I can identify. <clears throat> John, I just had a, a question here. How maybe um, I, have you thought at all about the kind of Roth and the Roth and Ramachan um, papers talking about the uh, how sensitive are these estimates are to um, nonlinearities and in, in or violations from from parallel trends, like and. I'm still working through like how maybe these different estimators might compare it or might uh, perform if there are deviations. Do you have any, have you thought a little ball about that? Like how this estimator might work? I mean, it seems like it might be more sensitive than some of the, than some of the other ones to, to thinking about that simply because of the way that the, the, the logic is working here. But I don't know if that's true. I'm still working through that myself, but uh, my yeah. thoughts. Right, I mean, I, so I have thought about that. Um, but I don't have answers to that question, so I'm not really sure. And um, like, you know, I mean, like I said, um, I, I only recently read that paper myself, so I feel like I'm still sort of trying to, you know, completely internalize all of the logic of it, too. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think I think one consideration is that um, if you were using an approach where you were only identifying treatment effects by comparing outcomes in a particular post-treatment period, to outcomes in a particular pretreatment, just one particular pretreatment period, my thought is that that could increase the sensitivity of your estimator to violation of parallel trends. If that pretreatment period that you're using um, happen, if something weird happens to be happening in that pretreatment period. But on the other hand, in the two-stage approach, you're essentially assuming that that uh, parallel trends is holding right throughout the entire pretreatment period. 
and then using that to estimate the ATTs. And so I'm not sure I'm not sure if there are relative advantages and disadvantages. Those are just the sort of uh, desiderata that, that I think might be relevant. But it, it's a good question, and I really don't have a good answer for it. And I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Somebody's probably writing a paper about it right now. But um, yeah. so I don't know. And it's a really it's a really good question. And I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, I mean, like, I think uh, Kirill said something to the effect of, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he said something to, to the effect of, oh, I think that's a really interesting paper, but oh, we should have a reason to expect parallel trends to hold if we want to be using these estimators in the first place. So it's not clear how much we should be necessarily worried about it. I mean, if we wanted to understand how much parallel trends holds, but um, you obviously can't test for that kind of thing, but we should have at least some r rationale, perhaps economically or like in our in our setting that hints to us that parallel trends should be holding here. So maybe uh, we shouldn't be looking at these uh, approaches that wouldn't allow, or that would allow for deviations from parallel, parallel trends, because that's ultimately what we are requiring. Right, right. Uh, and again, yeah, I mean, that that also makes sense to me. Um, I guess it kind of supports my argument, so maybe I should yeah. adopt it. But, uh, but uh, I just don't want to say too much about it because I just feel like I haven't I haven't thought carefully enough about it. And also, I always feel like everything's a little bit of a minefield in this literature where you never know when something that seems like an innocuous thing to do might turn out to be explosively wrong, right? I mean, I feel like that's the whole difference in differences literature to begin with. So I'm always a little hesitant to make any claims that I haven't really thought very carefully about. Um, so I don't know. It remains a question to me. Um, yeah. Okay, but anyway, so, um, but, uh, you know, just, just basically talking a little bit about, a little bit more about why this approach works, just uh, at least assuming the ideal conditions that I'm assuming, you know, basically unbiasedness just follows from the usual arguments about unbiasedness of OLS. And then if you've got micro data, then you, the, you, the consistency of the estimator follows from you know, similar arguments. If you're working with aggregate, with average data, then I think you have to make the claim that, um, you know, if, you, if you've got like state by year level averages, I think you have to sort of make the claim that those averages are computed from a lot of observations. And so you've got consistent estimates of those averages in any given group, in, in any given sort of, you know, say state and year. Um, you know, just under random sampling and applying a lot of large numbers. Um, but then if that's true, then in the limit, essentially what you're doing is regressing the true state by year level averages um, on, on uh, treatment status. And so you can, get, can, you can get consistency that way. But when I was thinking about this, I always think about differences and differences in terms of like, I've got like a state and year level variation, um, but actually Liao Wang and Zhu and Borussiak, Jarvel and Spice, they also show consistency for the case where you're working with individual fixed effects, which is something that I had never seen about. And so, or I had never really even been thinking about. Um, so again, I think that their asymptotic theory is a lot, is a lot better than mine. Um, and so you should, you could also check out their paper to get a, a much more formal treatment of, of how this procedure works. Um, one thing that I should point out that I uh, didn't mention in the paper is that when you're doing this procedure and there's no covariates, this, this two-stage procedure is numerically equivalent to estimating a regression like this, where you regress outcomes on group and period effects, and then some vector that's saturated for treated units, right? So for example, if you have um, all interactions between group and period, um, for treated units or all interactions between say cohorts and durations, right? So sort of like something that's similar to a Soon and Abraham specification. If you do that, and then you average these out according to the sort of the distribution of groups and periods among, um, among treated units, you get numerically the same answer as you would get using the two-stage approach, right? And the intuition behind this is that if you've got sort of a saturated vector for treated units here, that thing is going to absorb all of the variation in outcomes for treated units. And so when you do that, these, these fixed effects are already identified just from untreated observations. Um, and so um, it, the, the, it's really sort of the same thing as estimating these effects uh, using the untreated, using untreated observations and then averaging out the sort of the imputed differences. That's the same thing as just doing this, estimating, manually estimating, say, the group by period specific ATTs and then just averaging, averaging them up. Um, when you start putting covariates in the model, things get a little bit different, but there really is, in, in some sense, a, like a, a close equivalence between this approach and the two-stage approach. 
Um, and, and uh, you know, I mean, I think to me that also suggests that there's, there are really just multiple ways of dealing with this kind of heterogeneity, even just from within a regression context. Um, okay. So um, let me say a little bit more about some of the estimates. So, uh, you know, as I noted, the, the way that I've described this two-stage estimator, um, what it's going to identify for you is the overall ATT, right, which is just sort of the average of the group by period specific um, ATTs among the, the units that are treated during the periods in which they are treated. Um, but one, one consideration here is uh, it's not so clear that this is necessarily the thing that you want to identify, right, the thing that you want to know, right. And so when you have heterogene heterogeneous treatment effects, it's not clear how best you should be summarizing the heterogeneous ATTs, or if you should even be summarizing them with one summary measure at all, right? And you know, uh, so Callaway and Santana provide a really good discussion of this, and so my discussion is going to be a lot, I mean, a lot simpler. But um, you know, just as an example, in the three by three case, right, you have essentially three different treatment effects that you're averaging out. You have the first, the first treatment cohort. Is treated for the for the, their first period and then their second period and then the second tra uh, treatment cohort is only treated uh, for their first period and if you sort of average those out it's not really clear how you should be interpreting that right because if the effects of the treatment are changing over time then you kind of have a biased average because you have two first period treatment effects and one second period treatment effect right and so depending on the question that you're trying to answer that might not be the thing that you want to know. And again, it's just not exactly clear what you should do. So it's kind of good to have some flexibility. Um, one thing that you could do within the two-stage approach is just drop treated observations beyond uh, uh, some common treatment duration, right? So in the example that I was just talking about, you could just, in the second stage, just drop the second period for the first treated group. And then what you would be doing is you would be averaging over the first period of treatment for both groups. And that might make a little bit more sense because even though you're only looking at, you're only figuring out the effect of the first period of treatment, you're averaging that over all of the groups, right? So you're saying you, so you could, that might be just a little bit easier to think about what this, uh, you know, uh, it might be a little bit easier to interpret what you're identifying in that case. But again, I think it sort of depends on what question you're trying to answer, right? If you're asking the question, how has the treatment affected those who have been treated so far, then I think this overall ATT is a sensible thing. But if what you're trying to do is predict how the treatment is going to affect um, units that have not yet been treated in the future, then maybe that's not what you want to know, right? So I think it kind of depends. And I, I think that this is an advantage of some of the other estimators that are out there, right? So I mean, the Soon and Abraham estimator and the Callaway and Santana estimator provide you with a, a lot of flexibility to estimate, you know, any sort of combination of treatment effects that you want to, uh, that you want to estimate. And, and actually the, 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 the DID imputation estimator um, also gives you more flexibility, right? Um, and so, so my relatively simple approach um, gives you some flexibility in terms of what you're going to estimate, but I think it's not quite as, as, as widely applicable as some of these alternative estimators. Um, but that's a, that's a real issue that I, I think that people should be aware of. John, um, just on that, I, I think that might be a good uh, part to ask, like maybe explicitly. So if you wanted to look at subgroups, taking your like state by your example, let's say that you wanted to, and your groups are the are the treatment cohorts, right? Right. So let's say that you wanted to look at instead that how those effects might actually differ between states that have a Republican um, governor and states that, that have a Democrat governor. Is that something that you can do with your estimator or is that something that we should look to the other ones or like how might you uh, uh, practically go about doing that yeah so i i well i mean as i've never thought about that before my, my intuition is that you could handle that pretty easily in the second stage by just interacting treatment status with those with those groups right um because in this in the second stage essentially what you're looking at is just the is essentially the average deviation from your prediction, right, for treated units. So if you if you do that, you can do that for subgroups, and I think that that should work, should would work fine. Although I have to admit, I, I, I had never really actually thought about that. So I so uh, I think that works, but uh, ho hopefully there's no flaw in my logic there. Um, okay. okay. Um, so thinking about covariates, I didn't even really put anything about covariates in my paper because I wasn't sure what the best way to handle them was. And I was still kind of trying to wrap my, my mind around it. But uh, 
you know, so there's several different things that you could do. I think in a traditional regression specific uh, regression DD specification, we're sort of implicitly assuming that the treatment effect doesn't really vary by covariates. And so if you wanted to do something like that, one thing that you could do is just estimate a, a first stage regression that includes some covariates. And then in the second stage, adjust outcomes by subtracting off just the group and period effects that you estimated um, and just regressing that on treatment status and covariates. And I feel like this would sort of be like the two stage version of the traditional regression and different regression difference and differences specification. But this might not be the best idea, right? Because we might be concerned that the outcomes actually do uh, uh, the, 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 the effect of the treatment actually does depend on covariates. And so a, so a more robust thing that you could do would be to just um, you know, estimate this first stage regression and then just subtract all of this stuff off when you're adjusting outcomes, right? So take outcomes and then uh, subtract off the estimated group effects, uh, period effects, plus covariates times the estimated coefficients on the covariates from the first stage, and then just regress this whole thing on treatment status, right? And this is what, what other people have suggested when they've when they've used a, sort of a two-stage or an imputation approach. And this is probably advantageous because it's got a little, an extra degree of robustness, right? Because it allows for the possibility that, that the covariates sort of affect or are related to the effect of the treatment. Um, and then one thing that I, I, that I feel compelled to mention is that both of these specifications, the way that I've written them kind of implicitly assume that there aren't any covariate specific trends, right? Which is sort of a, a problem that Santana and, and, and Joe um, have warned about. And so, you know, maybe one thing that you could do to try to guard against that is to include interactions between your covariates and time. Um, but I actually think that I also have to admit that I feel like all three of these approaches are still more parametric than what Callaway and Santana do, right? And so, I mean, that's one of my favorite parts about the Callaway and Santana estimator is that it's robust, not just to treatment effect heterogeneity, but also to uh, the way that uh, that that covariates uh, affect things, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's less, it handles covariates less parametrically. So, but so these are some perspectives on covariates. Yeah. Sorry, John, I just wanted to ask uh, again here. So for in the Calvin Santana paper, uh, they talk about using only almost like in a, uh, like they do in, in, synthetic, in synthetic control, like only the covariates pre-treatment as that, right. but are we with this T subscript or these P subscripts on, on this approach that you're talking about here, does that, are we talking about the same thing? Or are we talking about a line for time varying covariates? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the way, the way that I wrote this, it kind of implies that you're allowing for time varying covariates, right? Um, um, although, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong about this, because I actually, I'm, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I'm, I'm not entirely sure what happens in the RDID package when you do the doubly robust version of it. Does it actually allow for time varying covariates in the in the outcome regression? Do you happen to know? I feel like I should know this. Um, I don't. I think I remember Pedro saying something to the effect of that you can potentially like hack it in a way that makes that allows for the time varying covariates. But right. I think part of the I think one of the features that they talk about in the paper is that they try and really carefully make you think about what it is you want to do and they put up these barriers for things ways to they put barriers in the way of doing things i think might cause problems like here we're talking about like essentially like a bad control type problem right and they say okay well if you don't want to worry about that then just don't use time varying covariates and just only take things pre-treatment because we know these covariates can't possibly then be interacting with the treatment status if we're only using pre-treatment ones yeah yeah okay all right, all right, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I need to investigate that a little bit further. But, but, but you're you're right. I mean, the way the way that I have written this, you you have you have um, you have time varying covariates, right? Which is a thing that people do when they do regression DD. Um, but again, I, I I like the way that 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 Callaway and Santana are very are much more careful about this than people have have historically been in the past. Um, so. So again, I mean, I, I just I just feel like these are all issues that you need to think about if you're using this approach. These are issues that you need to think about in addition to thinking about what's the estimation approach that you're using. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but um, 
Huh. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to like de- uh, sidetrack you or anything like that. I just thought it was a good time to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I have to admit that there, there are so many things to be worried about when you're running these things. That uh, um, again, uh, you know, like, I think you kind of have to hold one thing constant and think about one set of problems, and then once you have a solution to that, think about the next set of problems and hope that there's not an interaction between them. And I, I have to admit that. I think that Callaway and Santana do a really good job of worrying simultaneously about this whole basket of problems that we might be running into. Um, so, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, like favor Callaway and Santana. I like all of the estimators that people have proposed, but uh, uh, so I, 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 I also like Callaway and Santana. So, um, okay. So in terms of, I called this event studies in my paper, but I guess this is sort of a misnomer. Maybe it would be better to call it, um, dynamic effects. But essentially, you know, everybody I feel like understands at this point that, you know, Soon and Abraham have shown that event study regressions that people run have problems that are very similar to difference and differences regressions. And, you know, the paper I talk about a little bit that if you want to get a little bit of intuition on this, you can motivate it by a, a non-linear, non-linearity argument that's kind of similar to the one that I was making for uh, diff and diff. Again, it's not completely rigorous. If you want the rigorous argument, you have to read Soon and Abraham, which is a really nice uh, and impressive paper. Um, but I also just like to have intuition on things. And so you can you can motivate um, those problems that way too. Um, all I really have to say about dynamic effects or event studies uh, in, the, in the two-stage framework is that the two-stage framework handles it pretty easily. Because essentially what you can do is in the second stage regression, instead of regressing these adjusted outcomes on treatment status, you can, reg- you can uh, regress them on indicators for different treatment durations, right? So indicators for, for you know, being in the first period of treatment, in the second period of treatment, in the third period of treatment. And that's going to identify for you estimates of the overall average effect of being treated for one period for two periods, for three periods, and so on. So the two-stage framework adapts pretty readily to the case where you want to know dynamic effects. Um, I think that in my notation here, actually, it makes more sense to think of, of uh, the, the periods as being years instead of groups of years, but that's really just a notation thing. Um, but that's a little bit different than event studies. Uh, you know, you also have to worry about sort of testing for parallel trends. And I think that works a little bit different in the two-stage approach. Um, so the, the two-stage approach actually does sort of have a built-in test for parallel trends, right? And the test is that um, if parallel trends holds and there are no anticipation effects, then if you, if you did a, a second stage regression that included some leads of treatment status, those leads should all be equal to zero, right? Simply because parallel trends is saying that, you know, on average outcomes equal the group effect plus the period effect. And so that should be true, um, you know, that, that should be true regardless of whether or not you're, you know, two or one or three periods away from treatment status, right? And so you sort of have a built-in sort of informal test for parallel trends here. Um, I never really talked much about anticipation effects, um, but if you were concerned for anticipation effects and you wanted to allow for, say, a certain number of period of uh, periods of anticipation, I mean, one thing that you could do is just do a modified version of the first stage where instead of using untreated observations, you use observations that are at least K periods away from the treatment. And you could do that as well if you had some sort of reason to believe that there, you know, you thought that there were going to be, I mean, sometimes this happens where a policy is announced before it's implemented. So maybe you think, I'm, I'm expecting that there will be a year of anticipation effects, or at least there could be. Um, so you could do that as well. But there's sort of a caveat about this test, um, which is that it's a little bit different than a sort of a tr- traditional event study regression, right? So I think I think that in a traditional event study regression, if you've got leads of treatment status, you can kind of interpret those as being average differences relative to whatever the omitted period is. Um, but you don't really have that interpretation when you're doing this sort of informal test for parallel trends in the two-stage approach. And the reason why is because when you do the two-stage approach, you're assuming that parallel trends holds, and then you're estimating the group effects and the period, period effects. And so if parallel trends doesn't hold, right, then you don't actually have consistent estimates of the group effects and the period, of, period effects. And so you just can't interpret the coefficients on these leads as being sort of the average, you know, average deviations um, uh, for units that are a certain number of periods away from treatment um, from sort of uh, deviation relative to some reference group. 
right? So really, all, all the, the only thing, the only interpretation that you could put on the coefficients on these leads is that they represent the average residual uh, in the first from the first stage for units that are a certain number of periods away from being treated, essentially, right? So in other words, the the first stage is y minus your group effect minus your minus your period effect. Right, that, that's sort of the residual. And that thing in the whole sample has to average out to zero by a property of just these squares, but it doesn't have to be zero in every subgroup. Um, um, but if parallel trends held, then it would be zero in every subgroup, including subgroups that are defined by how far away you are from treatment, right? So that's kind of how you could interpret this. Um, so that's just something to be aware of is that the interpret, I mean, this is true of other estimators, uh, some other approaches to parallel trends testing too, is that the interpretation of what you're getting is just a little bit different than how you traditionally interpret leads on in, a, in an event study progression. Um, and this is just a, the, the way that I'm describing this is really sort of an informal thing. Uh, Leo, Wong, and Zhu actually develop a more formal testing framework that's based on the same idea. And they also talk about the fact that you could also do a placebo-based test. Um, and then they talk about sort of the relative advantages in terms of overfitting versus um, you know, ha having a test that's underpowered of, of these different uh, ways of testing parallel trends. So they have a much better discussion um, uh, than I do of this. I only ever thought about this informally uh, when I was sort of first working on the paper to begin with. And I don't really feel like it would be appropriate for me to really steal any of their ideas. And then uh, Bruce Jack, Jarvell and Spice, um, they just suggest a, a different approach, although I think it's kind of still related, where they say, okay, well, in your, you know, still use the sample of untreated observations, but then just, in, you know, choose some number of leads of treatment status and test if they're significantly different than zero, right? And this is sort of similar to the idea that I was talking about in the sense that you're not estimating a particular, like, placebo ATT, you're just implementing a test for whether or not there's some apparent violation of parallel trends. But one, one thing that's really interesting about the approach that, uh, that they are recommending is that uh, they show that it kind of circumvents the Roth critique, right? Which is actually, you know, at least under certain conditions. Um, um, and so I think that that might make their, their approach preferable too. So there, there are, are, are several different um, things that you can do to try to test for parallel trends from within this two stage or the imputation framework. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of idea that I described is just sort of one sort of informal, re re relatively informal test. Um, okay. Uh, regarding inference, um, you know, there's different things that you can do. I think the simplest thing, if you wanted to implement this manually for some reason, sometimes I like to implement things manually. I'm like a little bit of a do-it-yourselfer. Uh, you can just bootstrap the whole thing. Is uh, you know, this is what uh, Leo Wong and Chu uh, recommend doing in their paper, and it, this is also what the uh, Fakrel and Tho do in the paper that that where where they sort of implement a, a similar uh, event study related idea. Um, and that, and that's you know, I just feel like a really a, a relatively simple approach. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are advantages that using bootstrap standard errors anyway. Um, alternatively, my thought was, okay, well, you could, you could interpret both stages of this two-stage procedure as being sort of a joint GMM, a GMM estimator, and then just use results on, you know, using, thinking about uh, two-stage estimators as joint GMM estimators to just correct the standard errors for the fact that you're using a generated uh, dependent variable in the second stage regression. Um, and, and I think uh, that, that if you use, uh, you know, Kyle, Kyle Butts, who's a PhD student at the University of Colorado, he's actually implemented um, the two-stage estimator in some Stata and R packages, and it, they're, they're really good, in my opinion, if you ever um, start to run the risk of feeling like you're good at writing Stata or R code, take a look at Kyle's code, and it'll disabuse you, it'll disabuse you of that notion. But as far as I know, he's implemented both of these approaches in his packages. Um, but the other thing that you could do is you could just download the DID imputation package, right, which is, I think is now publicly available on SSC. And, 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 and you know, Brustiak, Charvel, and Spice have developed richer asymptotic theory than I have. Um, and so, uh, you know, another thing that you could do is just, just use their, their asymptotic theory and, and use their package, which, you know, I, I mentioned before, I, I, I like their theory better than my theory. So um, that's another thing that you can do. So there, are, I feel like there are a few different ways that you could handle inference um, in this setting. Okay, so, uh, so that's my summary of my paper. Um, let's see, I have, I've got, we, we go till 3.15, is that right? Uh, you can uh, you can take kind of 
up to like another half an hour kind of thing. An hour and a half is like the kind of standard-ish uh, time that I think people have been doing because that's the standard seminar unit, I think. Okay, <laughs> so okay. if you if you want to go through them stuff afterwards, I'll, I'll just say afterwards, I'm going to go and I have some R code, uh, some examples coded up using Kyle's package in R. So we're going to go through that afterwards. Okay, but, um, okay. So yeah, take some, take if you want to go through some more stuff, go for it. Okay, well, I, I only have a little bit more. I, I hope I haven't been going too fast. Probably I just didn't have enough material to begin with. But so I'll show you some so, some simulation results from my, my paper. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just did a really simple simulation. I'm hoping to do something a little bit more general in the future where I had uh, essentially 50 units in 10 time periods. And I simulated the setting where the treatment was adopted in periods four, five, and six by different groups. And then um, I assumed either that there were five units in every group in one simulation or between five, 15 and 10 units, depending on the group. Um, and then I, I just sort of manually coded some treatment effects that change over time um, for each group. And then I, I estimated everything by differences and differences in event study regressions. I used the two stage approach and I used the kind of aggregation approach that I talked about before where I do a regression that includes interactions between treatment status um, for every cohort and duration um, and then aggregating those up. Um, so um, one thing that I wanna show you uh, is what the difference in differences weights look like. And I mean, again, this isn't novel. I think this is from Deshaies Martin and Dahl Fui, but I, I don't know if I had ever seen these weights sort of graphed out like this before. So I thought this was a, a sort of interesting and kind of clarifying for me. So here's what the weights on the group by period specific um, diff and diff uh, specification, here, here's how they're, they're determined. So this line is group one. And what you can see is the weight that their treatment in their first period receives is really high. But then what happens in the next period is now some additional units are being treated. And so more of treatment effects that are occurring in that period are getting absorbed by the time effects. And so the weight that group one's second period treatment effect receives goes down a little bit because now there's more units that are treated when this treatment effect is accruing to that group. And then in the next period, even more units get treated. And so the third period of treatment for the first group receives even less weight because even more units are treated when this group is treated. And then after that, nobody else adopts the treatment. So the weights are constant in this case. And it's the same thing for the second group, right? So for the second group, they, they, they everything kind of over, overlaps. Um, oh, uh, some, somebody has a question? Do you wanna, uh, you can go ahead and interrupt me if you'd like. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, so, so I have a question about this graph. So in, yeah. in the first period, the group one is getting maximum weight because that is only only unit group getting treated. And right. then in the next period, since more units are coming in, their weights are going down. So is that the reason or is it also because of the fact that there is uh, some of the effects are being absorbed by the period effects? So I, I kind of lost you over there. Oh, it's the same. I, well, I, I, my interpretation is that it's the same thing because more, more groups are being treated. And so OLS is saying, OK, what's happening in this period is more due to a period effect. And so that's why it's attributing less of the treatment of the treatment effect that's occurring to this group is being less of it is being attributed to the treatment and more of it is being attributed to the period effect. But that's because more units are treated in that period. Okay. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. Okay. Hopefully I'm getting it right, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, but this is sort of what it looks like. And then for the second group, uh, they start off they start off uh, pretty high and then they drop down. And, and then for the third group, by the time they're the last treated group, so their weights are always constant, right? They, I mean, it drops down to zero here because you never see them being treated for more than five periods in my simulation. But so this is an inter, I mean, to me, this is an interesting way of thinking about how these weights are determined. It's still not quite as intuitive as the Goodman Bacon decomposition, but it was, it was interesting to me. Uh, okay, so that's what the DD weights uh, look like. Um, and the, by, the, by the way, the other thing I should mention is that once the treatment, once everybody's treated, what happens? Group one has the lowest weights, group two has the middle weights, and group one has the highest weights, right? And that illustrates the idea that, um, if you're treated for more, if you're treated for more periods, then OLS thinks that your treatment effects are partially due to your fixed effects. They think that there's something permanent about you. So then at the end of the day, this first treated group, which receives the treatment for the largest number of periods, um, also sort of receives less weight after the number of units that are treated stops jumping around. But um, 
anyway, so but so here's my simulation. So here's the true overall average. This is simulation one is the true overall average ATT. Um, the diff and diff estimate is so it's 4.08. The diff and diff estimate is 3.5, right? So we have we, we clearly see this diff and diff weighting problem here. Um, when I do with the aggregated estimator, my estimate is 4.12. The two stage estimator is numerically equivalent in this case because there's no covariates. And that's also equal to 4.12. Uh, this, the only difference between simulation one and simulation two is the number of groups that are treated. So it doesn't really make much of a difference here, but we, we still see that diff and diff is, is biased down in this case, but the aggregated and the two stage estimators work pretty well. Um, like I mentioned before, is it really a good idea to use this overall average uh, effect of the treatment on the treated? Maybe not. In, this, in the case that I'm simulating, every group is treated for at least four periods. So I could look at the average across all groups for the first four periods. And so when I do that, the, the, the true average is 3.17, the aggregated estimate and the stacked estimate uh, and the two-stage estimate give me 3.2. They're all identical in this case. Um, when I do the second simulation, it's still true that the aggregated estimator um, is identical to the two-stage estimator, but the stacked estimator is a little bit too high. And that's because the stack, the, the weights that the stacked estimator, I, I sort of didn't talk about this earlier in the presentation, but the weights that the stacked estimator uh, puts on the individual treatment effects um, partially depend on the group sizes, right? And since there's variation in group sizes, it ends up being a little bit off in this case, although it's still pretty close. I actually kind of like the stacked estimator too. Maybe I'm, you know, I, I like all of the estimators. So, um, so, uh, but that's, that's just why I only, the only reason I, I only put the stacked estimator in, in this simulation because I, uh, it was, it's easier to estimate it for this four period average than it is to estimate, to do something that's um, similar to the overall average using the stacked approach. Although I think you can still do it. And then I, I have some, uh, some sort of event study type graphs. And the only thing that I wanna point out here, um, you know, so I can do these duration, I can use the two stage approach to do these duration specific effects. And that's what I have in the, in the, in the lower graph. In the upper graph, I just have a traditional event study that doesn't allow for any heterogeneity. And one thing that you can see here is that this, this shows evidence of this phenomenon that Soon and Abraham talk about, right? Where in my simulation, parallel trends actually holds exactly. But when I, when, I, when I do the simulation and I do a traditional event study, I get point estimates on these leads of treatment status that are actually a little bit, that there aren't, they're not very close to zero, right? They're actually a little bit negative. And this is something that, that Soon and Abraham talk about. They say you could get, you could get spurious violations of parallel trends because of, of heterogeneity. But when I use the, the, the two-stage estimator, um, these things are centered right on zero, right? So they correctly show that parallel trends hold. Um, so, you know, this is just, these are some very simple simulations. I also wanted to show you um, an example from the literature and, and I actually, I hope I'm not um, stepping on Taylor's toes here. I kind of, I used a, a paper from Otter uh, in, in, as the empirical example in my paper, but when I talked to Scott Cunningham, I started playing around with his data um, on the Castle Doctrine. And I was just, I like playing around with this data because it's from uh, Shung and Hoekstra. And Shung is one of my coworkers and, and, and Hoekstra, uh, taught me one of the best classes that I ever took in graduate school. So I, I really like these guys and I like playing with their data. So um, I, I thought it might be fun to, to use a slightly different example. So they're essentially looking at the effect of like standard ground laws on um, log homicides. Um, so I'm looking at uh, log, well, they're looking at the effect of that on violence. I'm looking at log homicides per capita. Um, and in some cases I use some covariates. The covariates that I put in, I kind of just chose randomly were unemployment and poverty rates. Um, so, uh, again, here's an example of the difference in differences weights. And here I've, I've, kind of, I've normalized these by the group sizes um, because those also affect the weights. But if you normalize all the groups to be the same size, this is what the weights look like, right? And so you clearly see group one, they start off with a high weight and it kind of tapers off. And group two, same thing. And then this last group, they only get treated for one period. So this is the weight that uh, the regression DV puts on their, um, on their single group. Uh, you know, period where they get treated. But it looks very similar. And also for some reason, it kind of looks like in difference curves, which I also thought was interesting. But, um, and then I, I just, I just, you know, really quickly, I estimated, um, I used a few different estimators to look at the basic specification, right? So I did uh, a two-way fixed effects estimator. Um, and the, the point estimate that I get is um, 0 .0, about 0 0.07 and 0 0.069. 
Um, I did two, the two-stage approach manually, and then I just bootstrapped the standard errors. Um, and I got um, a point estimate of 0.075, right? So a little bit higher, um, and then a standard error of 0.035. I did an aggregated estimator, right? So I did, uh, in this case, what I did was I included separate interactions for treatment status uh, for every group in period, right? So every group in period that was treated had a separate sort of uh, 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 dummy variable in the regression. And then I just used the margins command in Stata to average all those out. And again, the point estimate's identical. Here, the standard error is actually a little bit lower on here. Um, and then the next thing I did was I just used the GMM function in Stata to estimate the whole thing. And again, this is uh, identical. All of these point estimates are identical. And here the, 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 uh, the standard errors are also pretty much identical. Um, I did a version with covariates where I included covariates in both stages, right? So I included covariates in the first stage, but I didn't subtract them off in the second stage. Instead, I included them as regressors. And when I do that, I get a similar point estimate. It's a little bit bigger, 0.078, similar standard error. Alternatively, you could only include covariates in the first stage, right? And then just include the, the estimated covariate effects among the things that you're adjusting for in the second stage. And so when I do that, I get pretty much the same thing again. And then finally, I also interacted the covariates in the first stage with time. And do, doing that um, gives me, again, a fairly similar estimate. So in, in this case, it turns out that the covariates don't seem to matter too much anyway, and it doesn't seem to matter how I incorporate covariates in the model. But that's probably because I, I used a poor choice of covariates that don't seem to influence anything anyway. So I think, I think that you might get more pronounced differences in a case where the covariates were actually mattering more. Um, but I, but, but I, I felt like this sort of just illustrates, um, uh, you know, the different ways that you could implement this. And again, these are all just ways that you could implement this just on your own, right? You also have in addition to this Kyle's package and you can use the DID imputation package. So there's a lot of ways to go. Um, and then uh, I think if you don't mind, I will just show you one other thing, which is probably not interesting to anybody but me, um, but I thought it was kind of cool. So, um, so here's my, uh, can, can you, uh, Taylor, is my screen visible? Did I share this right? Okay. Um, so here is just the, uh, the, the do file that I was using um, to, to, to produce those results. And um, what have I done? Can't, uh, Zoom is interfering with my, uh, with my uh, editor here. Um, what I did was I, I sort of manually uh, created the, the difference in differences weights, right? So over here, I'm not going to go through, bore you with all the details, but these are sort of like, you know, the fraction of units that are, the fraction of periods that this group is treated, the fraction of units that are treated in a particular period. And so I take that and I sort of constructed all of the components of the decomposition that I was talking about. And then I just compute the implied uh, diff and diff estimates, right? The diff and diff estimates that are implied by the weights. And come on, zoom. Uh, when I when I sort of go through that process, Stata, uh, when, when all is said and done. Oh, well, so so I'm sorry. I guess I I guess I I kind of skipped a step. So what I did was I computed all the weights, and then I ran a regression where I regressed outcomes on all combinations of treatment status group and period, right? So I got all of the, I got estimates of all of the, OLS estimates of all of the group by period specific treatment effects. And then I add those all up. And so when I, when I do that, um, Stata gives me a, a, an implied DD estimate of about 0.069. And actually when I, uh, when I run, when I just actually run uh, the, the two way fixed effects regression, then uh, I get, uh, oh, I, I actually, I think I screwed something up here. Absorb. When I, when I do the two-way fixed effects regression and uh, uh, no, leave it to me to, to uh, get this wrong when I'm actually doing it live. Okay, all right. What's happening here? Absorb, SID, I think my, uh, my nerves are getting the best of me here. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. Now it actually worked. <laughs> okay, so when I actually do the 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 uh, the, the two way fixed effects regression and I do it correctly, the point estimate is exactly the same, right? It's about 0.069, um, which is what I got when I sort of used the 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 implied the decomposition theorem to manually. Um, to, to, to sort of manually estimate the weights and aggregate everything up. And so this at, shouldn't be surprising, right? Because of course the math behind the decomposition theorem is right, but uh, I, I'm just always kind of impressed when something works out like that. So anyway, but so that's all I have for you. Um, uh, so oh, somebody had asked a question. Um, oh, did somebody have a question? Okay. Well, that, that's all I have for you. Um, I, I, I hope that that uh, you know uh, you, you found some of what I had to say uh, interesting and hopefully a little bit helpful. Um, if anybody does have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. But otherwise, um, I will just give the floor back to Taylor because he's going to do some um, some some R stuff. So, thanks very oh. much, John. Um, oh, Catherine, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Catherine. I just had one quick question. I think you touched on this, but I just wanted to ask you because uh, one, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks so much. I read your paper and played around with this data code. But um, with the stack DID, I think you said that you like there was not a specific reason why you were focusing on that because I just I think Taylor touched on this, but like kind of fitting all these pieces together, I've kind of wondered where stack DID sort of fits. And I'm just wondering if we could clarify that. Am I right? You just thought that you put this in because it was perhaps um, nice to implement or something, but there wasn't like a specific focus uh, on stack DID. Well, I, I mean, so I, I, I essentially I was um, well. I, part of why I talked about it is because in the appendix I had worked out what the implied weights were for stack DID. Um, which I don't know if, if that had been worked out before, but it, it turns out that they, it, it's essentially a, it's a kind of a very, it identifies sort of a variance and group size weighted average of the group by period specific treatment effects. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to demonstrate that in the simulations. Um, but the only reason why I, I, I had only included that in, in my second um, simulation because when you when you do the stack DID, it's a little bit easier. When you do the stack DID estimator, the way that I did it, it's kind of easy to choose the specific periods that you're going to be looking at. And so for the stack DID estimator, it's a little bit easier to, to estimate a, uh, a treatment effect that occurs over a certain number of periods uh, of treatment for everybody. Whereas with like normal diff and diff or with like the two stage thing, you kind of get this weird, um, overall ATT, which is over all groups, but also all periods in which groups are treated, but different groups might be treated for different numbers of periods. So I, I don't know if that answers your, I, maybe I was misinterpreting your question. Um, no, that's that, super, I, I guess I just was wondering kind of why it was included. Um, and I guess I read your appendix and I mean, I there's so many papers out there, I'm sure I haven't kept up, but I hadn't, you were the only, your paper was the only one that I'd seen I guess I'm not sure if this is the right terminology, like formally treated. So I just was wondering why, but I think you've answered the question. So oh, okay. You. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But anyway, I, I was I was just showing that the uh, the stacked DD estimator like works pretty well, but doesn't exactly identify the four period treatment effect. Basically, although I, I want to go on record as saying is that I still think it's a really cool idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, so I wanted to uh, touch on a little bit about what you can estimate. So when you are running this, you're having presumably some never treated units and some not treated units that will eventually be treated. Mm -hmm. When you have both of those in, should we only really be thinking about actually identifying the, um, the estimated coefficients up to the period where the last uh, unit is treated because after that it's just going to be these comparisons with the control with the never treated units. Um, but like, I'm so I'm not sure how to think about that. I know that Calvin and Santana they say like for theirs if you are only using the never treated units, you know they say okay you can only identify up to the period last period that's treated because after that you have no more control units. But if you do, like, how does that work for, for what you're talking about here? I just want to oh, yeah. make it make it explicit in case people are confused about that as well. Okay. All right. Let me tell you my thoughts on this. And then um, you tell me if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense. So I think that if you, if you 
if you're if you don't have a never treated group, so you're only using not yet treated units to as your control group, then I think you basically by the time the last group gets treated, then you run out of controls, right? So I think like, for example, if your first group, if by the time they're in their fifth unit of the treatment, the last group has actually adopted the treatment, then you can't identify any effects for the fifth unit of the treatment because now you're out of control. So you could only go up to four for those guys. So that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, with a, if you have a, 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 a never treated group, right? So just like a permanent control group, then I think then things are a little bit, you have a little bit more leeway. Right, because I think I feel like if you have, and but again, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like if you have, you know, if you have treat units that are treated for a certain number of periods, you can compare them to the untreated group, right? So you can always draw that comparison. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that you you could run in again. I've never. I, I just I, I just want to make it clear that I haven't really thought about this too much. So I, I don't. I'm just speculating, and I don't want anybody to like you know to, like to take the you know, this as being like too learned of an opinion. But I mean, I, I think sometimes people want to use consistent. Um, like if you if you if you were worried if you didn't want to draw comparisons only from never treated units, then you might be a little bit concerned about that, right? If you wanted to be using a pooled set of not yet treated units and never treated units, then even if you could technically estimate for, uh, uh, treatment effects for durations that were further down the line, maybe you wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. But when you're when you're working with a, with not yet treated units, you always kind of have this 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 changing set of control units, right? Because you're yeah. just you're you know as you go further along in time, you're losing control units, and so. So I, I don't. I think that historically people haven't been too concerned about the composition of the controls. But again, yeah, that's 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 kind of what I was thinking. Is like that's you know after that, after that period with say unit or period five when the last unit is treated. If you do have those um, never treated units, you can continue to estimate those. But then that composition is changing. But as you said, your composition is always changing as units are adopting treatment throughout. So it's not clear how much of a concern that really should be. No, it's, and then yeah. I guess the easy thing to do is say, oh, estimate it both ways and report both. I mean, I also have to admit, I've never done this with a, I've never done a true event study with a, with a, without a never treated group. So it's just some, something that I've only ever kind of uh, opined about. Um, so some, uh, someone has a question. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, so oh. just elaborating on that, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So if my control group is not yet treated units, can it can it become problematic if the if they are fundamentally different from units who are never treated at all? Like if the if it's not if, if the treatment is not random assignment, if they some units are chosen for treatment based on certain characteristics, then having a control group as never treated vis-a-vis -vis having a control group that is not yet treated they yeah. are two different things right well i so i uh, okay so again i i just i i'm a, i'm a little bit worried that i'm getting out of the realm of things that i've put a lot of thought into so i just want to again emphasize that i'm i'm kind of um freewheeling at the moment but uh i i think that essentially that like parallel trend if you think parallel trends holds then you don't have to worry about that um but i also think that Historically, some people have um, sort of as robustness tests used estimates using different samples, right? And so, you know, if you're like, I think under parallel, if you believe parallel trends, then that's something that you don't have to worry about. But, but maybe it's the case that people are like a little bit suspicious of parallel trends or something like that. But, but again, um, I mean, I, I just feel like that this is getting so specifically beyond um, what I know about that I don't want to say, I don't, I really don't, I want to want to avoid say, embarrassing myself and saying something that's terribly wrong. Um, so, so that's, so that's, that's my opinion. But I, I mean, I essentially think that in theory, right, if parallel trends holds, it doesn't matter if different groups are sort of, if some groups are triting out of the set of, of not yet treated, because the the that if you're if you're under the appropriate parallel trends assumption, I believe um, the the groups that are still not yet treated remain valid counterfactuals for groups that are now treated. So that is that is my understanding. 
Sorry. So I hope that's not more confusing. No, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of the estimators that in those papers they talk about you kind of in tandem with the parallel trend assumption that you you need to have this like random or that treatment timing is as good as randomly assigned. Um, or I don't know if that is implied by the parallel trend assumption or like which way those uh, the bidirectional arrows work for, for that if it's an if and only up thing. But um, I think that part of like the intuition of why people started adopting staggered uh, treatment timing settings or like trying to use that is because they were worried that selection into treatment and making these comparisons between treated units and never treated units just wasn't appropriate. And they were worried about the dynamics and that they were skeptical that parallel trends held. So they started using these staggered adoption settings or trying to exploit that variation that they had. And then that ended up, you end up making those bad comparisons that we now we know are not good, but that, that was like the logic that it was worried about this treatment selection issue. And that if you could compare these units because they were all eventually adopting treatment, so they should be even more similar, they should be similar, and you shouldn't have to worry about parallel trends not holding as seriously as using never treated units, which could be fundamentally different because of the lack of treatment adoption, or at least that's my understanding. Right. No, yeah, yeah. I, you're right. I, I, you, I think you and I are thinking about this the same way. Um, but um, yeah, you, you, I just feel like I'm a little bit unclear on some of maybe the ancillary assumptions that, that go into the different, like, uh, you know, that they go into formal justifications. Um, but, but yeah, right. I mean, it's for the same reason that, you know, um, like, you know, Pennsylvania is a good control for New Jersey, right? I mean, there's a reason why Card and, uh, and, and uh, Kruger weren't using California, right? Um, I feel like it's related to that. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. I think that if nobody else has any questions, I had one last question for you, John, and then we can jump into the uh, example, but so I was curious about, I think, so some of these other estimators are the level of aggregate or the level of um, the treatment effects that they're estimating and then averaging from is, is kind of different. I mean, there, it seems like there's like two camps, I guess one camp is starting with like the group time averages and then averaging those across these different group time period, like uh, cohorts. And then there are others and I think yours and the um, the uh, the BJS paper is are getting individual treatment effects, so like treatment effects per group member period time period, and then averaging across those. Is that right? Are there any advantages to doing it that way versus averaging at the group period and then and then averaging that? Am I being clear? Sorry. I I, I you know you are being clear. I I don't think that there should be. Well, okay. If, if what you're trying to identify is the things that I talk about identifying, I don't think there should be a difference because if you take all the individual treatment effects and then you aggregate them up to groups and periods and then you aggregate those again, that's really the same thing. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I think that BJS talk about how you could potentially estimate any combination of the treatment effects. And so, so I think that if you were using their, their more general imputation framework, that I, my understanding is that, uh, that they would be able to identify some things that maybe you wouldn't be able to identify if you were just going straight from groups and periods and aggregating those up. Um, and again, I've only ever thought about it in terms of, you know, kind of an aggregate. Um, so, so I don't, I don't have any good into, I don't even, I can't even really think of any examples of other things that you might want to try to identify. Um, but I, I do, I do feel like fundamentally, um, there's not really much of a difference between getting individual treatment effects and then aggregating those to groups and periods and then aggregating those to groups or uh, overall, I don't think there's any difference between that or just going directly to overall, right. In, in the sense that as long as you're using a consistent estimator in every case. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I think the only thing I was had in my mind was that question that I asked earlier about these subgroups because I think if uh, for whatever reason my intuition was that estimating these uh, these ATPs of the different subgroups would maybe be easier in this setting where you're starting with individuals and they can split the subgroups as opposed to starting with the group time periods and that's kind of might be this like um, non deconstructable unit at that point. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. That might have just been like yeah, some no, weird I, intuition I, I have. Yeah, yeah, could, right. Like if you were doing Callaway and Santana, a group would be like everybody who would drop, adopts the treatment at the same time. 
Well, although I think you could probably modify their thing to, I think you could stratify the groups. Yeah, probably. like an extra subscript. Yeah, exactly, right. I think you could say, okay, everybody that lives in this census region that ad adopts the group at the same time, right? And then you get all the census region and group by period specific effects, and then you could go from there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that the difference would be down to what maybe what's easier to implement. Um, so that's a good question. And again, something I've never really thought about too much. Perfect, thanks, John. So uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again, John, for agreeing to present this paper. I think it was obviously a very fascinating uh, paper. And uh, so awesome, awesome job. Um, and so with that, I think we'll move on to doing some R example. It's actually great that you did the, uh, the Castle Doctrine because that was the other, kind of have like these two working examples. One is continuing with the divorce unilateral divorce paper from Wolfers and Stevenson that, uh, that, uh, that Bacon uses. And then the other was this, because I know that it's the example that uh, Scott uses in his book. And I thought, perfect, that's available, we'll use that. So that, that's, uh, that's great that you highlighted that one. <laughs> okay, I was a little worried that I might be stepping on your toes. So. No, 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 not at all. <laughs>